Good evening, everybody, and welcome to prayer meeting. It's so nice to see you. And we're going to need each one of us here to sing in order to make a joyful noise. <laughs> um, the first song we're going to sing tonight comes from the story of Jacob. Do you know what it is? Do you know that there's a, a hymn that goes through the story of Jacob and seeing the ladder that went to heaven? Well, I didn't think of that either, so I'll tell you the answer. It's 473, Nearer my God to thee. So as we sing these verses, think about that story of Jacob. We're going to start we're going to start with the second verse. We all know that he had to run away from home and there he was with his head on the stone. And this is where the song picks up in verse 2. We're going to sing verses 2, 3 and 4 of Nearer my God to thee. closer to Jesus, isn't it? I read a, a one line out of a book once, and it said, you can be as close to Jesus as you want to be. And I thought, wow, that's true. Um, we're going to turn to 590, trust and obey. And I'd like us each to think in our own lives of some area in our lives where it would um, be good for us to trust in the Lord and obey what he says. And let's enjoy the song together as we stand. We're going to start with verse 2. Not a shadow can rise.
our stands that we're going to sing. And I want you please to smile while you sing this, okay? We never can prove the delights of His love. Let's sing it. Thank you for singing. I'm guessing it's me. Happy Wednesday, everybody. How's everyone been? How's the week been? I love these more intimate gatherings. You know, we can really come together and looking forward to have a good prayer session after. Um, let's just have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, um, the privilege and honor to speak. Lord, I know I'm not worthy. I'm, I know I need you more than ever. So I pray that I may hide behind you and your cross and that you may give me wisdom um, and help me to speak. Uh, and then not be my words, but yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My sermon title today is The Seed of Persecution. I am somebody, when I left England, that used to love cycling. Now, cycling is something that I would do all the time. 30 miles, 60 miles, 100 miles, didn't matter what it is. I just loved cycling. My good friend and I, we started this journey together on cycling. His name is Darren. And he goes to church, well, he went to church with me in England. We used to work in the media team together. And um, we would sometimes, after camp meeting, camp meetings in England, if anyone has ever been, are extremely long. They start at 5 a.m., the services start at 5 a.m., and they finish at 9 p.m. It's an all day event. So for the media team, it's horrible. Because you have to be there earlier to set up, and you're the last ones to leave to pack down. So it's a very lengthy process. So for our downtime in the evenings, we would go cycling together. Then, um, naturally, as we went cycling, you know, most people would think that you just want to sleep, right? But we just wanted to get out and get some fresh air and we'd go cycling late at night. And naturally, there was other people in the media team who started to come along. One of these guys was a name called Val. Val was an amazing guy, always willing to serve, always on time, always um, putting everybody first, um, always just trying to give his best for the Lord, always uh, an able missionary. He was, he was a great guy. And he joined us, and we would cycle late into the um, sometimes early mornings and then go to sleep and then wake up again um, to start the, the day again. Obviously, that was, it was very late. But it was, it, was, it was a time of bonding together as a team. It was a time of just reflection. It was a time of fresh air, exercise, conversations. And I, I could look back at all my times at camp meeting, and those are the things that I remember, those conversations on the bike, just cruising by the ocean. Um, so as I left England in 2018, I had this really expensive road bike because I would ro ride all the time as I lived back at home. And I was deciding whether I was going to try and bring my bike here to America, or I literally was just going to sell up and get rid of everything. Eventually, at the end of the 2018 camp meeting, Val was like, hey, you know, what are you going to do with your bike? And I was like, oh, I'm not too sure. I'm thinking I'm going to sell it. He was like, I'll buy it. So I was like, OK. I gave it to him at a, at a good price because he was a friend, so much cheaper than I would have sold it elsewhere. But I was happy that my precious bike was going to somebody you know, useful. Kind of moving forward, um, Darren, who used to ride with me, now started riding intensely all the time with Val. They would do the 100 milers all the time. They would do events and things like that. And it just didn't stop. 
that just continued. And I always used to look back on, on, uh, on the app Strava and I'd see their rides and I'd be like, oh man, I wish I was there. But I wasn't. About two months ago, um, Val and Darren set off for this 100 mile ride. And um, Val is an athlete. So he was just built to do anything sports. Extremely fit um, guy. As they set off to race, naturally Val always ended up being the person that was ahead of us. So he just went for it. So at mile 48, Darren gets, to, gets there and there's a blockage in the road. It's cornered off and everything is, the race has been stopped and everyone's been told to get off their bikes and wait. So Darren gets out his phone to check where Val is and he has to find my friends. So he checks where Val is because Val was way ahead. So he presumes that he would have gone past the blockage. As he checks his phone, he realizes that Val is actually a few yards in front of him, but on the other side of the blockage. So he began calling Val nonstop. Val's not picking up. And eventually, someone picks up. Hello? It was a police officer who picked up. The police officer picked up, and um, he basically said that something had happened and to make, um, for Darren to make his way to the front so that he could meet up with Val. Unfortunately, at mile 48, um, the fittest guy I know, his heart stopped while he was riding. And he collapsed to the ground, and um, he was without oxygen for a very long time. Eventually, they managed to resuscitate him. And as they resuscitated him, he had to be airlifted to, to hospital. And when he got to hospital, he was obviously in a coma because of the lack of oxygen. And he stayed in, in the coma for a while. After doing multiple tests on him, the doctors realized that they weren't sure what was going to happen to him if he woke up because of the brain damage that had been caused. He, they said that he had automatic functions like breathing, like reflexes, but they weren't sure what kind of mental damage he would have. Ten days later, I received the news that Val had passed away. He was one of the kindest people I had ever met. And it took me a long time, literally the last two months, I have been dealing with this behind the scenes. And I felt a little bit of guilt. And it's, it's, it's difficult to say why I felt guilt, but maybe one of the reasons could have been because I was one of the reasons that he got into cycling. You know, I sold him my bike, which perpetuated his journey to continue cycling. All those kind of things were going through my mind, just naturally. And it's a period of guilt of, what if went through my mind? And I had to come to the understanding and the realization God had to really impact my life and show me that this was nothing to do with me. He's the one that gives and he is the one that also takes away. But as I reflected on Val's, Val's life, 1980 was the year he was born. 2022 was the year he, he died. Often we see gravestones and we see dates and we're thinking, they were born this day and they died this day. But I want to challenge you to think that's actually irrelevant. That actually the most important thing is the dash in the middle. What did they do with their lives? Who cares when they were born? Who cares when they died? But what impact did they have on society? And this had been plaguing my mind. And as I began to think about this, I realized that the dash was really significant. Because Val was somebody, like I mentioned, who really impacted my life for the better. Bubbly person, energetic, happy, never looked sad, never looked gloomy, never looked frustrated. He got told to do a job and he would do it faithfully with no pay. This led me to study the book of Acts, chapters 6, 7 and 8. I really had been delving into this, these chapters over the last few weeks and reading them nonstop over and over and over again. And particularly the story of Stephen. Stephen is somebody who was the first Christian martyr and I wanted to look at what his life meant and what he managed to achieve in the short period of time that we have of him. Because we don't actually have that much history on Stephen. It's very, very small. It's, it's across two chapters, six, well, the end of six, and, um, and seven, really. And then by chapter eight, he's died. And that's all we know about him. But what we do know about him is he was someone that was extremely committed. 
I want to turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 6. And we're going to read just verse 5 for now. And we're going to find out a little bit about Stephen's character. Give me an amen when you're there. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. We're going to stop right there. He was a man what? Full of faith. Now, if we jump forward a few verses, we go to verse 8 now. And let's read verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Typically, when you read the Bible, when something is repeated within a few sentences of each other, it means it has significant importance. And this is why it had significant importance. He was full of faith. He was committed to whatever he did. He did great wonders and signs, even though it was pretty much illegal what he was doing in his town, right? And as we kind of jump forward into verse 10, it says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly, and by then it goes on to say the elders and the scribes, induced men to say, we have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. I want you to remember that, Moses and God. We're going to come back to that. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy place in the law. For we have heard him saying that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. An accusation against what he's speaking about. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him and saw his face, the face of a what? An angel. Can you imagine throwing accusations at your spouse or your child or somebody and then you turn around and their face is just glowing? I can't imagine what these people who were throwing all these accusations must have been thinking. Because first of all, they've made the accusation that he's been speaking against Moses and against Jesus. Basically, blasphemous words. What happened to Moses when he went to see Jesus or went to see God? What happened to his face? It shone. It was glowing. It was almost like he didn't have to say anything. But just the fact that he was shining was almost a direct rebuke. Because they were speaking against what he was saying in terms of Moses and Jesus. And ironically... His face is glowing just like Moses' probably was. But what does it mean for your face to just glow or to have the face as an angel, should I say? Having an angel-like countenance was an expression frequently found in Judaism. It was used to illustrate a brightened, enlightened, or awe-aspiring experience, or appearance, sorry. We just mentioned about it happening to Moses, but it wasn't the only time that it, it happened. In Judges 13 verse 6, it also happened to um, Samson's mother as, he, as she saw the angel. She quotes, she says, and I quote, His appearance was like the, his appearance was like the appearance of the of angel of God. Very awesome. And then it goes on to say also that when Jesus... In, 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 chat, in Luke, I don't have the reference to, to mind, but in the transfiguration, what happened to Jesus? Anyone? He was what? He was glowing. He was radiant. I remember um, one day, um, actually before I get there, for me this all tells me that Stephen was so connected to God that despite the circumstances of what he was being accused of, he had a peace. That just couldn't be explained. And I'm going to delve into that a little bit more. I'm not claiming to be angelic, although my wife thinks I am. But I have a very similar story. <laughs> She's probably listening online and laughing. But I, was, I, was, uh, um, I used to help run a Bible study back in England on a Friday before I was married, before I had kids. Um, we would study the Bible long into the Friday night. And often I'd end up catching the last bus home from my friend's house back to my house. It's about a 35 minute journey. And on this particular instance, I'd just been on a Bible study and I was actually bringing another friend home with me. And as we both boarded the bus, we sat at the bus and we noticed that there was a drunk guy behind us. And 
We just began our normal conversation. We didn't really pay any attention to him. The guy looked probably under 20. He was a young guy, right? But he was completely dead drunk. And um, as we sat down, we were just talking to ourselves, probably reflecting on, on some of the Bible study. And I don't remember the exact conversations that we were having. That's, that wasn't the important bit. But what I do remember is all of a sudden we felt this tap on our shoulder and it was this guy. And he looked at us. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone or looked deeply into someone's eyes and, and you can see that they're just trying to read you just with their eyes. And it was almost like he looked deep into our eyes and he was trying to read us. And then he blurted out these words. I want what you have. This guy was completely drunk. And we were like, what do you mean? He was like, I want what you have. I want the peace that you have. After that conversation, after he said that, we began talking to him. We prayed with him. We took his phone number, tried to keep in contact with him. But, that's, but it, it just never, nothing really materialized from that point. But it really impacted me that a drunk guy who's completely out of his mind is almost like he sobered up and he looked deep into our eyes and he was like, I want what you have. Like I said, I'm not claiming to be angelic. I'm not claiming to be wise. But what I do know is that the word of God gives you a peace. A peace that just can't be explained. A peace that can even be read on your countenance. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 1 is the next verse that we're going to jump to. Keep your, your finger on, on the book of Acts because we're going to be in there. But I just want to read this verse. Give me an amen when you're there. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 1. Who is like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face is changed. It's almost like connectivity with God because wisdom comes from God. Spending time with God gives you this radiance. It gives you this glow. And I can only imagine that this is what was happening to Stephen. We're going to go back to Acts chapters um, 6 and, and 7. We're going to stay there. I can only imagine that this is what's happening to Stephen. He was full of what? He was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. That means that he must have been totally reliant and totally dependent on God. Now, when Stephen stood before his accusers, glowing with the face of an angel, he was radiating God's wisdom and heaven's glory. Without speaking a word, Stephen's countenance gave witness that he was the Lord's faithful servant. Indeed, those Sanhedrin members ought to have remembered Moses' shining face. It's as if God was saying, this man is no blasphemer. He is like Moses, my loyal servant. The implication of Stephen having the face of an angel is that he, like Moses and Jesus, was a witness to and a reflection of God's presence, or the glory of God's presence. Finally, Stephen is given the opportunity to speak. And he, again, in, 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 in chapter 7 now, he begins to address some of these points, and he gives you almost the history of redemption. He goes all the way back and talks about Abraham, the patriarchs in Egypt. He then talks about Moses, and as we jump forward, he talks about God's true tabernacle. And then at the end, in 50 to 53, he then basically rebukes the people that he's speaking to and he says they're resisting the Holy Spirit and this is what they had done to Jesus. They had basically killed the prophesied one. It's interesting. Sorry. I lost the whole section. <laughs> I'll just read this. The Holy Spirit was giving these men every possible opportunity to accept the truth. But they rejected him. It's interesting that this is the bit that I had written down, but it's just come to my, my mind now. That when you're convicted of something, there's really two things that happen. Either one you surrender. Or number two, you resist. And often when you resist, bitterness, anger, and all those things start to creep in to your character. And this is exactly what happens to these people. It says here, spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit is often rejected 
because it comes in unexpected ways. Evidence upon evidence that the apostles were speaking and acting under divine inspiration had been given to the Jewish priests and rulers, but still they firmly resisted the message of truth. Christ had not come in a way they expected, and though at times they were convinced that he was the Son of God, yet they stifled conviction, and thus became blinder and more hardened than before. They crucified Christ, yet Christ in his mercy gave them additional evidence in the works wrought by the disciples. He sent his servants to tell them what they had done, i.e. Stephen. And even in the terrible charge that they killed, had killed the Prince of Life, he gave them another call to repentance. But feeling secure in their own righteousness, the Jewish teachers were not prepared to admit that men who had reproved them from crucifying Christ were speaking by the direction of the Holy Spirit. In this rejection, they eventually stoned Stephen and he became the first Christian martyr. This probably brought sadness. This probably brought fear, scared people. All kinds of emotions would have gone through all the other believers because now not only had Christ died and obviously risen and gone back to heaven, but now the first Christian martyr had died and then it becomes real. You know, Then it becomes real, one of your own ends up dying. But God had his hand in everything. Many people probably felt how I felt or my friend felt when my friend passed away. But God always has a way of changing, changing a bad situation into a powerful one. And it's only when you get to the end of the road and you look back and you're like, wow, this wouldn't have happened if God didn't allow all those bad things to happen beforehand. This is why I am who I am. This is why I am where I am, because of God. Now, the story doesn't end there. It, moving on to um, chapter 8, we're going to read the first four chapters. It says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, and that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So in all of this, in all the destruction and all the bad things that were happening, Saul went around persecuting, killing people, dragging them from the house people began to flee. And as people began to flee, naturally, if you have the good news about something, you can't keep it to yourself. So as they began to flee, throughout all this perse persecution, a seed began to be planted around the world. In the then world, no, in the then world known, in the then known world, anyway. Persecution has a way of driving the gospel forward in unimaginable ways. In all ages, God's appointed witnesses have exposed themselves to reproach and persecution for truth's sake. Let's take it all the way back. Joseph was maligned and persecuted because he preserved his virtue and integrity, and then he ended up saving a nation, including his brothers. David, the chosen messenger of God, was hunted like a beast of prey by his enemies and then gave us psalms to read in times of trouble and despair. Job was deprived of worldly possessions and so afflicted in his body that he was abhorred by his relatives and friends, yet he maintained his integrity and gave twice as much as he had before. He looked back and realized how God had blessed him. Paul was imprisoned, beaten with rods, stoned and finally put to death because he was a faithful messenger for God to the Gentiles, but left us with the majority of the New Testament and faith and hope to cling on to in those books of life. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, led the cry back to the Bible. His bones were dug up and burnt and his ashes thrown in the river. An old writer says this, hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon is a river, Avon into Severn, which is another river, Severn into the narrow seas, they, they into the main ocean, and thus the ashes of Wycliffe are, are the emblem of his doctrine, which now is dispersed all over the world. A seed planted that has never stopped. We move forward to William Tyndall. He brought us the Bible in English. His final words spoken at the stake. His final words at his death, sorry, that were spoken. At the stake with a fervent seal and a loud voice were reported as, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. 
One year later, a Bible was placed in every English church parish across the country by order of the king. Who would have known? Can you imagine that moment when, when, uh, the, 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 when we get to heaven and Stephen meets Paul? And Stephen's like, God had this under control this whole time. This is another one that always is probably one of my favorite quotes from the Great Controversy, and it always stands out to me. It's to do with Jerome and Huss. And they were basically being martyred. They were on the flames, on the stake. And this is what is read. This is what is said. Even his enemies were struck with his heroic bearing. His countenance, their countenance was telling them so much. A zealous papist describing the martyrdom of Huss and of Jerome, who died soon after, said, Both bore themselves with constant mind when their last hour approached. They prepared for the fire as if they were going to a marriage feast. They uttered no cry of pain. When the flames rose, they began to sing hymns, and scarce could the vehemency of the fires stop their singing. Only Christ and a connectivity to him can give your countenance such peace in the face of death. I remember the first time I ever read Steps to Christ. I was on a plane traveling actually from the US to England. And as I was journeying on this plane, um, I had just decided that this was the moment I was gonna read this book. And I pulled open the book and I began reading. And it's a very short book, so the flight was like eight hours or so. So, you know, you can read a substantial, you can read the whole book in that time. And I remember getting the majority of the way of, um, through the book. And all of a sudden we got hit with this crazy turbulence. I see people bouncing up and down. I see, you know, bags dropping down and, and, you know, those carts that they serve you with the meals was going down the aisle. Like, it was just unbelievable turbulence. I just prayed in my heart. I was like, Lord, protect me. And it was like everything just zoned out. And I just carried on reading my book. And I could, I could sense the fear that other people had around me, but I had such peace. You know, God, was, God had this. No matter, no matter what happens, God has this. And then eventually the turbulence stopped and I finished reading the book and I could sense the lady next to me kept looking at me and I just began starting this conversation and she was asking like, how did you have so much calmness throughout that situation? And I was like, well, actually, I was just reading this book and it was just done ama amazing things for my life. And we began having this conversation about faith, about the Bible, about religion. Eventually, as we, de um, de de um, we came off the plane, she had the steps of Christ in her hand. And I had finished it, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I knew that I could get another copy from someone else, but somewhere else, but I just gave her the book and it was in her hands. And it was like the peace that I had was attracting people to just view me differently. And I can't, I can't put any of that on me, you know, because in my natural state, in my human power, I would have been just like those people. And there is moments in my life in that Christian journey where I feel like those people. But there's also other moments in my life where I feel a strong connection and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing well in my spiritual journey and God has me and he has my back. And you can walk in the streets and just be happy. The sternness of your face is gone and the wisdom of Christ is beaming across your face. Now I want to wrap this up. The common theme of all these stories, as well as mine, is that they live their lives not worried about death, but focused on him. They all, like Stephen, committed to giving the dash on their gravestones to God. Not the birth date, not the death date. The dash is the most important thing. When we get to heaven, there's going to be a joy that we can't, we can't imagine. When we see who, people who have read us and been able to be converted to Christ. I really am looking forward to that meeting between Paul and Stephen. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to close on this final story. I recently read a book about the Iran's underground church. Now, if anyone knows anything about Iran, it's a Muslim country. If you get caught doing anything Christian-wise, you can be imprisoned, you can be killed, uh, you can be separated from your family. It's under extreme law, Muslim law, sorry. And there is a whole network of underground churches. It's almost that as, as, as the more persecution you see, is the more that the Christian church keeps moving forward. It's almost like Christian persecution is fuel. That's what happened in the Reformation. 
People began, began dying and began, kill, uh, began um, being martyred. And it was like that seed. Same thing happened in the early church. The seed of persecution projected the Christian faith forward. Now, there was a, a, a US, Iran, Iranian US pastor over here, and he's not Seventh-day Adventist, but he has a ministry over here called Reach Iran. It's Jesus calling. <laughs> and he runs a, re- a ministry called Reach Iran. And he has this TV network where he is pumping out content to people in Iran, and he has all these people connecting, him, connecting to him through the internet, through the underground church, asking all these questions and all this kind of stuff on the work that's um, on, on how they can be me- more meaningful and impactful in the, in the churches that they're working in. And he decided to run this conference in Turkey. Now, Turkey is a neutral, neutral place, very easy for, as always, the direct flights from Iran to Turkey, so it's very easy for the, the persecuted Christians or the underground church to get to Turkey, and it's very easy for Americans to get to Turkey. So he ran this whole 10-day conference in Turkey. And uh, the, 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 the sessions were throughout the day, and in the evenings, because these Iranians were so persecuted and the, the church was so underground, it was very difficult for them to just openly worship. So every time these sessions would finish, between, 10, uh, between 9.30 p.m. and 2 a.m., they would have open prayer sessions and worship. Just worship till 2 a.m. And then they would start again the next day for 10 days straight. On the last night, the presenter, the pastor, he was looking around, and he knows the dangers and the persecutions that, and things that are happening in Iran. And he was looking around at the joy in these people's faces, and he felt a deep conviction to just stop the session and give them a training session on persecution and what could potentially happen to them. So he began speaking to them about what could happen, about imprisonment, about death, about this, about that, da 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 He just goes on and on about all the dangers of the gospel. And then finally, this guy stands up and he's like, Pastor, we know what's happening in Iran, but we can't keep the gospel to ourselves. So we're going to do it anyway. Can we get back to worshipping and praying? And this this took the guy like he knocked him back for six. Because he's like, wow, these people, like in America, we're free to worship. You know, in the majority of Europe, we're free to worship. But these people could literally be dragged out of their house, just like those early Christians, and killed or imprisoned or murdered. Just because they want to worship the true God. And they know that. But they want to... Continue spreading the gospel. In Richard Wormbrand's book, Tortured for Christ, and anyone who knows who Richard Wormbrand is, he was a, a communist, he, he was living in communist Romania, and he was under severe persecution. Anyone hasn't read his book, Tortured for Christ, it's amazing. He was in prison for numbers and numbers of years, but he continued preaching the gospel even in the, in the prisons. And he said this, persecution has always produced a better Christian, a witnessing Christian, a soul-winning Christian. Now, I invite you all to be joyful in the trials, no matter the obstacle. Know that God knows what he is doing. He just needs you to soak up his wisdom, have a joyful countenance, and trust in him. Let's not focus on the birth or the death. Let's focus on what we do with our lives in that dash. In the middle of those numbers, it what represents our lives. Let us pray. Father in heaven, In the midst of a country where we have peace, relative peace, we know there is a time of trouble that is coming. We're not immune from that. We know that uh, Christians are going to be able to practice their religion, um, not just here but across the world, in harder and harder circumstances. But through this persecution, it seems like a seed continues to grow. It seems like the gospel will continue to move forward. And I pray that you just give us strength and wisdom to be pioneers and leaders in this work, wherever you see us fit to serve. Lord, many people have gone before us and set the benchmark, has set the, has paved the roads, the early church, the reformation, and even those in Muslim countries and other places around the world where it's difficult to spread the gospel. I pray we may lean on these experiences and these encouragements of the Bible and stand faithful and firm and realize that when persecution comes, that you are in control. 
that you know what is best for us. You know what is important for our lives. Help us to be joyful. Help our countenance to beam you wherever we go, that people who look at us may see there is a difference in us. When we walk to the shops, people may see something different, a joy that cannot be explained, a peace that cannot be explained. I ask, dear Lord, that you may be with me personally on my journey and everyone else in this room, that we may be committed to you and you alone, that we may put to the back of our minds all the distractions and things that are preventing us from serving you. I thank you for um, giving me words to speak now, and I pray that you may lead us and guide us as we go throughout the rest of um, this prayer meeting and the rest of this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we, we, we separate, I think it would be nice for us to get into groups of three or four and just have a prayer session. I do have a particular prayer request. Um, the story I told you at the beginning of my friend um, who passed away, my other friend who was the one cycling with him, I think has become so traumatized and stressed about watching these things happen to his friend in front of him that he has been hospitalized for the last three weeks and the doctors don't know what's wrong with him. And my fear is that the same thing is gonna to happen to him. So I pray that, I ask that, you know, if, if you guys would be willing to just pray for my friend, his name is Darren, um, pray for him and just pray that he may overcome and that the God will give him peace about this whole situation too. Thank you.